It's time for the Wrestling Perspective, episode 389. Serena De La Renta will be joining us here in a few minutes. We have your questions. Lars Fredrickson, Dennis Farrell here, Wrestling Perspective. Lars, are you ready? I'm ready. I mean, I, I'm born ready, pal. All right. Uh, question number one. This comes from Nick, Lars, and Dennis. This bloodline has been a crazy story in the WWE. Now that they split Jim and Jay up, how do you think the direction will go with them both? And do you see them coming back together as a tag team eventually? I'm sure we're going to see it, you know, at some point. I, I would think that you can't keep those guys. I understand why they split them up in the first place. They have I to mean, at this think, point, right? Yeah. And I think that they're both single guys. You know, they, they need somebody because, I mean, obviously – you know, Roman's doing the limited engagement kind of thing. And I feel like, uh, you know, they need Jay and, and you know, I, I don't know. I just, I feel like it's been, a, it's been, a, I mean, what else can they do? You know what I mean? If it was, if these guys were in, you know, an AEW or an Impact or New Japan, I think that I would keep them together, you know, just because you could do so much with them. You could, you know. Um, because you know, you're obviously allowed to go to different companies, but I think as tag team, as a tag team, they've done the most that they can. And I, and I feel like, you know, this just sets up the story for, you know, to keep, to keep it going, honestly. Now as as, I, go ahead. I was thinking about this all, all day long when I got to see Mill. out of all the brother tag teams, you had the funks, you had the Steiners, Everybody in the Von Eriks in the history of wrestling are the Usos the best brother tag team that can be separated to be singles wrestlers? No, the Von Eriks I think would would have would have been that team. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I think they're close. I mean, I think they're up there with the greats. I think that if you, if you, they're in the top five for sure. I mean, Better than but, I mean, because Rick was never a great singles wrestler. Yeah, that's debatable. But um, you know, I always preferred him um to his brother. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, there's been you know, so many over the years. I would think uh, but I mean also legit though, like legit brothers, though. I mean, that's that's the thing. It's like because there are, were many tag teams that were brothers, you know right. what I mean? So, um, the Andersons, right? Oli, they were yeah. not really brothers, right? I don't believe that they were. I mean, uh, to, uh, Arn wasn't even an Anderson. He, he was, I mean, when he debuted, and I guess it would have been Continental. Yeah. I'm thinking it would be Continental, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I he I don't even think he I think he went under his real name. I I think you know maybe Lars Anderson and and Oli maybe. Yep. Uh, or Oli and Gene. I you know. Undertaker uh, King were not really brothers. Spoiler. No, but for see that, that's the, uh, yeah, but that's the thing. It's like legit brothers. I don't know how many you know over the years in my lifetime of watching wrestling that I can remember that I would think, you know. Uh, I would think the Von Ericks for sure would be the top. They were just, they were a wrestling family. And they, uh, as are the Usos, they're part of a, you know, a bigger wrestling, even a bigger wrestling family. But I mean, it's, it, that's an interesting question, you know, Dennis, honestly, like, are they th the best to be split, to be single stars? Maybe, maybe they are. Because I mean, you know, if you think about when the Von Ericks, you know, was it told, it, it, it feels much like the, around the same time you know, with the Usos, you know, that they're sort of the most popular, they're part of the biggest storyline in, in wrestling in the last couple of years. So I, I did have to slip this one in. This comes from Paul uh, Lars with Punk being released or fired from AEW. How does it change your personal view on the product overall? Well, it was hard, it's, right? You know, because we've all had friends that have been fired from companies and you go, fuck it, I'm not watching that company because my buddy's gone. Well, I, you know what? That's the thing. It's like, I feel like I was a fan of that company prior him, to him coming in, obviously. Um, and then I just, I, 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 
it's just been so freaking hard to watch. You know, I just, it's all about kickouts and it's, I don't know. It's not. I'm glad you said know. that because yeah, this goes into our next ca- question from Steve, who says, I'm going to try to keep this non-punk related, but since his departure from Collision, you've noticed a downtick in the quality of the show. How do you think Collision Collision can rebound from this? And do you think the show has gone down because of Punk's departure? And I say yes, by the way. Well, no, yeah. Give an answer. Well, yes. I mean, I mean, it was obviously when he was there it was a pure, you know, Southern style wrestling show where tag teams were sort of the focus. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you look at those main events, you know, there was a lot of, you know, tag team kind of action. Uh, I think that collision's probably going to disappear into the night. Um, I don't think a Saturday night wrestling show was the smartest thing to do to begin with. Which breaks um, my heart because I grew up on Saturday night wrestling. Yeah, me too. But I feel like it's a different day and age, you know, for people. And I don't necessarily know if a lot of the core audience is going to be sitting at home on a Saturday night. No, I mean, they still... With DVR but, now, though, does even... does. Yeah. Does that stuff even matter nowadays? So honestly, well, I mean, if you you know, I I'm I'm assuming that the industry still goes on ratings because I mean they do talk about ratings and they do talk about viewership and you know, you know, core demographics and things like that. So they do. That is part of you know the overall makeup of pro wrestling, you know, and I feel like if you know one of the things that I was thinking is like the 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 obviously the network really wanted to be punk, uh, uh, you know really loved punk and really wanted him to be there and that's probably why they were gung ho about it but now that he's gone i i honestly think that it, you know it's i mean AEW gets a core audience uh every week for wednesday you know and if you look at those ratings which i've been sort of kind of getting more interested in um I used to be very interested in it during the raw, you know, obviously WCW, the Monday night wars, it was a big selling point to watch the shows, but, um, and it kept you interested. Uh, but I would say that, you know, they have a core audience coming, you know, to, if you know, to watch them on TV. I think that they've, they've burned out a lot of the, I mean, they're not, if you look at how many tickets they're selling for their live events, it's not, it's not WWE standards. I mean, they're half if if they're lucky filling places, you know. Right, uh, and, and that's totally okay. I mean, we expect that from one A and one B, and we don't try to hold them to that that standard. And I think we said this on our last episode, but boy, the way they handle talent is feeling very WW or WCW esque. And as as someone that lived through it, I know you have kind of a turnoff for me as a fan to have to yeah, read I mean, that again. Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, obviously, like watching Wednesday night and saw Swerve cut that promo, I was like, okay, here's somebody I can get behind. But I mean, AEW's track record is that they start a story and they never finish it. I mean, when did Keith Lee and Swerve ever even get in the ring? You know, <laughs> right. You, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, I, I'm turned off by the product in a massive way because it's hard to be, uh, you know, it's like my man's like family, right? So I'm sure, you know, if the roles were reversed, I, I would be treated the same way by him. I, I'm just not very interested in it anymore. I, I mean, there's so much other wrestling that I can kind of sink my teeth in. Too, I've you know, we have a lot of impact talent on the show, and that's for a reason because we're both huge impact fans. And I really family and impact, yeah. And I I believe they put out the superior wrestling program now. We said that from day one, by the way. Yes, we have. I mean, like we're all of a sudden we're like, oh, impact's better. We've said that from day one. As much as we love AEW. Impact is a show that puts up quality show that just nobody watches. NWA, MLW, and we also say the same things about those guys. Yeah, and MLW and NWA are putting out great wrestling TV. And 
except uh, there's some w we don't talk about them anymore well I, I, I don't know why, but um, I do occasionally catch some of their some of their their shows. But I definitely think that that they got really big, really fast. And I think they're just seeing a result of that. Um, that's sometimes what happens. Right. Uh, I love I love professional wrestling and I will always love professional wrestling and I will always support it. So. You know, I just I think I'm just taking a break from AEW right now because honestly, there hasn't been anything really to watch. In a very, I mean, FTR obviously is something that I want to watch. I I, I think um, Juice is f- a phenomenal talent. We've had him as a guest. No, um, what? Not no, yet. We haven't. I thought no, we had Juice. no, we've we've had his buddy on a few times. So we oh, have that's right. Juice. Uh, we've right. talked about Juice a few times. Juice yeah. is a uh, interesting interview from what we've heard in the past from other people that have interviewed him. Uh, right. Not to get too far into the weeds on this, but uh, let's. Well, do- I think he's a talent. Oh, phenomenal talent! I love Juice. I I hung yeah. out with him once. The most amazing, nicest guy in the world. I love I what that. the Bullet Club has done with opening up their you know licensing to other uh, companies. You don't see that the smart. I think we said that at the beginning before they even did this. Smartest thing the Bullet Club could do is is let other companies use the Bullet Club name. Mm-hmm. All or right. it's just going to sell merch. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's do one more before we get to Selena, who is uh, in the waiting room on hold. Lars and Dennis, over the last year, what has been your favorite match to watch? Which is a hard one. Let's, it is a hard one. Let's say. 30 days because I don't know if I could name one over the last year. Well, I, no, I'll tell you what, I'll, my favorite match to watch was Cody and, um, um, uh, oh, the hipster, uh, not Brock. The one, no, the hipster, the hipster. Oh, What's Rollins? His name? Yeah. Even though I, I think Rollins is, it's just, there's nothing really interesting there, but when Cody tore his peck, that match, was yeah. probably singly one of the greatest matches that I felt like I was witnessing because I was watching it live and I knew it was the, it was the first time in a long time when there was something you know there's been a few I shouldn't say that but that I could connect with Cody because there was something real and he, they put on a dynamite match. I've got a couple. I would. I'm even- sure Meltzer gave it a star though. You know. Right. Well, it's WWE, so you have to negative four stars because of the product name. Um, but I would go back and say I would even put even just recently MJF versus uh, Adam Cole on there, which was a great storytelling match yeah. overall. Uh, anything that had to do with Sami Zayn over the last year has been amazing. Sami Zayn, he really sold me especially with the bloodline and then the Kevin Owen stuff and tag team champion stuff. I I really think this last year really, really cemented that. Hey, Sami yeah. Zayn is a player in this game. Oh yes. He He's major player. Uh, um, but yeah. Yeah. So uh, listen, guys, we get your emails every week. Wrestling perspective podcast at gmail.com. Email us. We're moving away from the punk stuff. So let's not ask us anything about punk anymore. We did we did a show. We're happy. We moved on. So should you ask us anything else? We want to hear your stuff. Yeah, wait until it gets to the WWE. <laughs> <laughs> WrestleMania guys look at crossed. Yeah. Or Fingers if you listen to Meltzer, he'll be back in AEW in a few months because you know that's what Meltzer's reporting and he knows more than yeah. everybody else. Or maybe we'll see. Uh, yeah, I don't want to like get lost. Oh, I just Moving got on. Text on. just said, fuck Meltzer. I don't know where that came from. Anyways, <laughs> Wrestling Perspective Podcast in a second. Selena De La Renta from MLW. We can't wait to talk to her. We'll see you guys in a second. Terrible lighting. Lars Fredrickson, Dennis Furrow here back with Wrestling Perspective, hanging out with the flawless. I think that's the only way we can call it the flawless Selena De La Renta from MLW. Her a return after two plus years, I think it is, Selena. Yeah, uh, two, two going on three. And it took that for you to be able to accept our invitation to the podcast. Uh, you know, <laughs> people from behind the scenes don't know this, but we've sent email after email after text messages. I think I've been uh by told by the courts that not to contact you anymore because we've been no 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 you were told by court 
Court. Oh, told by court. Sorry about that. The <laughs> legal documents uh, confused me not to contact you anymore personally. So we had to go through lawyers to get you on and I'm not allowed within 500 feet of you. So that's why we're doing Well, lawyers. that's because you lunged at her. <laughs> I lunged at her. That's right. That's what happens when you're dirty. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, thank you so much for coming on, talking wrestling and hanging out with us here on the Wrestling Perspective. Uh, how, how how are you? How Thank you for coming on for your first time here. Well, thank you for having me here. I'm very excited to be here and ready to talk about whatever you want to talk about. Seriously, let's have some fun. The the check cool. is cleared. That's why you're here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Ask the damn question, Dennis. Let's go. All Hello. right. Uh, you know, I'll I'll be honest. I, uh, we all here are MLW fans. And when we knew that it was confirmed that you were coming on, I was like, man, you know, you are such a throwback to wrestling back in the the ages you were a former wrestler manager you've done everything now that you're getting in the backstage roles with mlw do you miss the in-ring aspect to your career do you feel like there was like some unfinished business i know this is kind of like starting out but we're getting to know each other we're, all, we're almost best friends here besties but uh you know Deep diving into you, I, I it feels like your in-ring career just stopped. And it, I don't know if you feel like there is like a hole in your heart where you wish there was more in-ring, but are you happy with where your career has gone minus the in-ring aspect? Well, when I started in professional wrestling, everything that I did was wrestle. And then what actually helped my career take off was that I broke my leg and mm. After that, I the only thing that I could do was either talk on a mic or throw shirts at an event or maybe sell front row tickets, you know, something like that. But um, MLW gave me a chance to manage the entire Spanish division. And I was actually, I had a cane. So if you watch the first episodes of MLW, you'll see me with a cane. I didn't use that just to flare up my character. I needed it to walk. So the that alone, like I don't miss breaking legs, breaking body parts. I don't miss having concussions. I, you know, I had multiple issues that happened because I was wrestling. So as far as the wrestling goes, I don't miss it. I enjoy hiring people to do the dirty work for me. It's a lot easier. It pays a lot better. And uh, in the time that I took off from the last time that I was at MLW, I certainly miss being in the ring and just talking and getting my people out there and it's always fun but it's a lot of time that you have to spend on the road and I wanted to go to you to Full Sail University and I got a scholarship and so I was able to pursue my dream and focus on school so that's why I had to take some time off and but now I'm back I'm graduating in November so I'm ready to go <laughs> well you know being in the managerial role and like you said you got hurt this opens up doors right and you step into this role was it hard what well, hard transition for you because you've got to think differently you know you're no longer a performer you know it's more of a now a psychological verbal kind of thing so did you find that a hard transition for yourself well definitely not because uh it, it was hard for me to learn how to wrestle that was that took me a long time so for me to be able to go through tables to get hit in the face and day and night kicked like that is very hard but for me to be quite frankly be a bitch that's mm -hmm. natural and i enjoy <laughs> it <laughs> well I, I i watched all your stuff with uh Altu. i loved what you were doing with her so you guys play perfect to each other but when when we're talking about coming back to MLW, how does that happen? Because like you just said, you left to go to school, get your degree, you graduate in November. What are those conversations? Do you reach out to court? Does court reach out to you? How does coming back to MLW happen? Well, you know, I left the company, but we didn't have any bad blood. So it wasn't like the door was closed. It's just I needed time for to focus in my career. And mm. I call I called MLW and I let them know, hey, I'm missing my home. Can I come back? And it was as simple as that. One, two, three, got back in. 
that's not how good podcasts work. We need juice. We need you to lie about something. Just say, you know, you you MF court. You were like, motherfucker, I'm coming. Just lie. <laughs> I <laughs> threw a fit and yes. I called him out in Spanish. What do you want me to say? <laughs> you just said it. Perfect. That's what we do yeah. here. We need dirt. Exactly. Oh, it was so difficult. <laughs> Well, you know, you you were gone for that period of time, and obviously the wrestling landscape changed. You know, in a, in some ways dramatically, some ways it stayed the same. I mean, it's a, it's kind of a different uh, place to be in a lot of ways. Like MLW has new TV shows. You know, it's 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 on a bigger uh, um, station. You know, there's so much so many ways that you can you know consume wrestling. I mean, e even though when you left, it was theirs too, but it's it seems like there's there's another boom period for 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 wrestling um what did it was that a little bit of a shock for you walking back in um i wouldn't say it was a shock it was just different so i was well I how was it different? to see more familiar faces and i can't say that i recognized about 90 percent of the people there as in i knew who they were i just didn't know them personally so it was a lot of hi nice to meet you who are you and uh but it did it, it felt really good i don't know if you've been in any professional wrestling locker rooms but the environment can be like pretty dark and heavy and in the past mlw was like very family-like but there was a little bit of situations here and there i'm sure if you go to the dirt sheets you can find out what kind of stuff but uh in the new locker room it felt really easy it felt good it felt like everybody seemed to be doing better i don't know if you know this selena but i'm a former ring rat myself so oh boy. I've been, yeah i've been to a lot of back of uh different wrestling uh <laughs> My my buddy PD, who you know we talk about on the podcast, I've spent a lot of time at Back in Impact, so I know exactly what you mean. But now you go for two years, you come back, and when you know you were one of the big faces of MLW before you left, you come back. Do you feel like you come back as a rookie or a newbie, or do you come back and step oh, no. in like a leadership role of this was my home? I've just been on vacation. For you personally, how do you feel coming back into a? A environment where once again you don't recognize more than half the faces well i don't recognize more than half the faces but they all recognize me so that just says that i have left a legacy behind so to me i will never be a newbie in major league wrestling i feel like when you say mlw you immediately think of me you can think of many other wrestlers at the same time but as far as the females go you always think about selena de la renta first and i always make a point to make myself be known so uh, I'm back and I'm taking over. That's just what's happening. Well, you know, one of the things I was thinking about, because, you know, obviously what had having watched you wrestle, um, I was always I was always curious to who sort of inspired you to kind of lace, you know, lace up the boots and get into the ring and do what you were doing. Well, I grew up um, doing theater, sports, never watched wrestling growing up. And it wasn't until I moved to the United States to pursue a career in film that I came across the Total Divas show. I was mm -hmm. doing, I was studying reality TV and I went to study that format. And as I was studying, I was like, wow, I really want to do that. So it was the Total Divas show, how they had their own reality. And I, I loved seeing the fact that they were friends behind the scenes, even though in the ring they're slapping each other's faces and now I, I guess i'm toxic i'm like i would love to have that kind of relationship where i can punch my best friend in the face and still go for coffee after <laughs> you know looking back through your history you've had a lot of inroads in the wrestling career with so many iconic wrestlers from penta to sammy callahan to conan i mean it just goes on and on and on and as you start from, oh my gosh, I love, you know, that's the reality aspect of wrestling to wrestling to manager. At what point do you feel like, holy shit, I think I made it in the industry? Uh, somebody had to tell me. <laughs> Who was I, it? How did it happen? It was LA Park. Um, I remember just being... I don't remember how long in my career I've been at this point, but I remember, I remember saying to him, yeah, one day I'm going to be as big as everybody here. 
And he was like, what are you talking about? You already are. And I was like, oh, he's being sweet. But then I got interviewed by um, Sports Illustrated and I could see that my my social media kept growing and growing and growing. And I started making significant amount of more money. And I was like, okay, I think that I could officially say that I've made it. There's a Wikipedia page on me. I'm like, I got a blue check mark. I think that's it. I think that's it. So I was invited to, um, in, during WrestleMania week, they do WrestleCon and big conventions. And any time that there was a big wrestling event, I just so happened to be there. So it was then that I was like, okay, I think I'm officially a face of wrestling. Well, you know, you, you're Puerto Rican. You're born in Puerto Rico. There's such a huge history of pro wrestling in Puerto Rico with Carlos Colon. Um, did you ever go back, you know, once you got into the business and see that rich history? Did you ever go discover any of those matches with the, the duel of the butcher? You know, because I mean, there if we talk about blood bloodbaths in professional wrestling, we can go to Puerto Rico. So did you ever yeah. go and explore old Well, wrestling? I went and explored personally. I didn't go back and find tapes, but I did get to see like what wrestling looks like nowadays in Puerto Rico. And I was on a show with Invader and uh, mm -hmm. it, it was fun meeting other people and seeing how that had been there my entire life and I never even explored it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's dark in Puerto Rico and that explains why I am the way I am. <laughs> it, it's tough getting so high being so young it because it, 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 you've reached a very pinnacle that not a lot of people have gotten to especially at your age where do you go from here and and i mean from personally i mean we can all say oh mow is my home forever we love mow court has been amazing to us but i mean outside of that where do you go professionally from here? How do you build your brand? Where do you branch off? There's so many different, you know, branches you can go to now to grow the Selena name. Well, over the years that I've been in professional wrestling, I've been able to know how much I don't want to be a wrestler. So uh, the next steps for my career is basically applying everything that I learned at Full Sail University. And I want to be able to open my very own professional wrestling circus. So it's a little different than what everybody else is doing. Uh, but that's my dream. That's what I would like to do. And uh, that, and I also, I, I don't know if you know this random fact, I have 17 pets. And uh, 17? Yeah, well, they're not all mine, only 11, but I foster and I have a big passion for animals. So I, ideally, one day I can open an animal sanctuary and I'm Jewish. So I probably am going to have a bunch of kids. Who knows? <laughs> I'm I'm going hard on life, whatever comes. Well, you know, it, with what you have right now and, and, you know, where you are positioned in the company, you know, you were talking about that the locker room when you left was a totally different locker room than what it is now. Yeah. What do you think changed the most to make that environment way uh, uh, more pleasant? I think the changes in leadership and the fact that I, I really, Court did a really good job at filtering through whoever was a problem. And now it's just harmonious. It's beautiful. I loved being there. Um, I, I really just think it's it was just plug and play, you know, so take this person out, bring a new person. And if anybody's giving problem, next. Well, you know, you're saying that you're going to start your own company. What, what do you take from that experience? What kind of personalities, you know, because I mean, obviously, when you're a wrestling company owner, you have to deal with a lot of egos, a lot of, a lot of narcissism, which is part of the deal. You know, to be a performer, you have to have that level of ego or narcissism in your job to be successful. So how do you, you know, handle that juggle the egos? Well, that's a great, a great question, because it's kind of like a you know, depends on each person. So it's case by case that you decide how you're going to deal with it. But I 
personally think that MLW did a really good job at if somebody is new and there's somebody more experienced, they put them to work together. And in wrestling, there's only one way of working, and that is being on the same page and being a team. So I think that the fact that they make everybody feel equal is a, it's a really good way of doing business so if i were to run my company i would take that from the way that court runs his business uh, he never i've never seen him bring anybody and then just bash them and treat them like garbage like everybody has a spot in the locker room everybody gets promoted evenly it's it's very nice it's diverse so it, it feels good we talk a lot about the creative aspect on the show and uh between you, Selena, the on 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 screen character, and then learning the backstage side of the industry. Where do you draw the inspiration in this kind of two part question from Selena on screen to being the manager? Do you you know who did you watch? Who did you love? What did you you know aspects of other people did you bring into your on screen character? And then backstage when it comes to producing. Uh, who helped you? Where did you draw that inspiration? And how different is producer you from on screen character you? Um, I would say that I go a lot harder when it comes to wrestling itself, because I don't play around when it comes to titles and championships. Like I, if we are fighting we're fighting and i'm gonna give it my all so when it comes to that I'm, i become pretty fierce i would say that i get most of my inspiration from my mom latina moms are savages so i've learned to just bolt through life and get what i want not at any cost so that is my main inspiration has always been my mom as far as studying people in professional wrestling i actually never did that i enjoy watching other people's stuff but i just feel like if i study somebody and i use their work as inspiration then i am taking from myself i'm playing myself i'm being a copy of somebody so uh, in order to keep it more original i search for characters that are in like tv series or like mainstream music so like, like the evil queen from from once upon a time her thing is she decided she's not gonna love anybody because that love is weakness so when i heard that i was like i'll take that so i take one little phrase from what she's saying and i i actually believe it like you can't you can't have love and while you're working my boyfriend has nothing to do with wrestling because if you do, the minute you bring your family in, it gets messy. So that's for that side. But as far as my producer side, I grew up um, doing so I wasn't always Jewish. I grew up in a Christian church. Well, in a Christian cult, but that's another talk for another day. Oh, um, no, no, it's a talk for no, this. No, it's day. not. It's a talk for right. Oh, yes, that's right. right. Way to open that door, Selena. Oh, yeah, way to go. Dark, dark. Um. Well, we'll get into that in a second. I'll finish. <laughs> I'll give you this answer. I came from a dark place, all right? But in, in there, we did a lot of church plays. And I remember watching the director. And I always wanted to be her. I wanted to write my own things and create them. So my it started young. And then I, I decided to pursue film and I went to Valencia Community College but I knew that community college is not going to do anything for me so I got an associate's degree so that I could get a scholarship at Full Sail University because it's a hundred thousand dollar degree and I did not want to pay for it so I a lot of my film knowledge comes from there I also work for a company named Flying Peanut Productions so we make movies and reality tv and we produce shows like Rockville um, so I, I get a little knowledge in everything that I do. I will say that I learned a lot from court when I was at MLW a few years ago, because he did let me executive produce a few episodes. So I, I got to be pretty hands on in the producing aspect. And I love it. I'm definitely not going to be an on screen character for the rest of my life because I'm going to get older and I'm going to want to not do stuff. But I will never get tired of producing and creating. That's that's my big passion. OK, before we get lost in the cult stuff, I um, never. <laughs> you said it. So is there anybody that you've worked with whatever it was, where you were kind of like, this is going to be a hard day at work. And who's, you know, and then there's obviously the times where it's an easy day at work. So 
would you say that you're having more hard days or more easy days at that job? Um, at, at MLW or uh, the Flying Peanut? Well, at the producing. Um, well, as far as producing, every day is an easy job because when you're doing what you love, it's just second nature. I don't know. It just, the day flies by and next thing you know, you're done. And it's like, seriously, Can we start all over. So to me, those are the easy days. The hard days are when people are being problematic people and their attitudes. And then, well, well I just have I to mean, be, we're, just, we're talking about court right now, right? No, not court. Court is easy to work with. We he love you, court, but to you're hard to work with. Nobody. You're hard. Hard. I didn't say that. Okay. I did. I did. I did. Yeah. <laughs> you know who's hard to work with? Conan. He doesn't shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> why, why can't I? See? You know what? I can see that. You know, I can see that for sure. But, um, you know, I, uh, so that one of the things before. So you said you're, you're brought up in a cult and that you're kind of a dark person. Do you think that experience, have you taken any of that experience that you had in this cult, which we need, need to know the name of? And uh, brought it into your on-screen personality. Certainly. Um, there's a few rituals and things that I did uh, <laughs> during the MLW episodes. Um, so, yeah, I did take inspiration, especially speaking in tongues and things like that. Um, yeah, that definitely came from the cult days. I used to be a dark person, I will say, but I don't feel like I'm a dark person. I'm a dark character, but I'm Jewish. You know, we have a light, light soul. I'm I'm very happy where I'm at in whatever I do, even though other people may perceive it as evil. It makes me happy. Well, you still haven't given us the name of the cult. So what's oh, the name God. of the cult? Okay, it's called Vija Evangelica. You're not going to find it online because it's supposed to be this super secretive thing. Um, but it's in Carolina in Puerto Rico. Um, so it was in a, so it's like a corner house. And they have like about, I would say like two acres of land. And is, uh, what do you call those houses that are made out of like roofing material? Deco? What is it? It's like a stucco, kind of like a California clay home. I don't know. It's just creepy as shit. It's like <laughs> made of, <laughs> it's like made of metal. I don't know. It's like metal and it has like crevices. Anyway, the Trailer. whole place is like made of Single. that. Yeah, I wouldn't know, even if you got the correct term. So it's made of that. And then we would meet um, Mondays, Wednesdays, um, some Fridays, some Saturdays, and every Sunday. And some of the services would go for like five, eight hours. It was ridiculous. Um, and then so the reason why I say it was a cult, because everything that is done, and I hope I'm not offending anybody, is uh, done in the name of Jesus. And then they have uh, the cult leader. She is a, it's like fifth generation pastor and her mom used to speak tongues and apparently she was this big phenomena in Puerto Rico. So then eventually she took over the church when her mom died and we had to present our day. That's what it was called. So you would tell her what you're going to do in your day. And then she would speak to the Holy Ghost of the Trinity, you know, the Holy Spirit. She would talk to him. And he would reveal to her what I can or can't do during my days. But the stuff that he would say would be things like you can't wash your hair or like for two months. It's ridiculous, super disgusting. It be stuff like that. Uh, at one point, I was told I couldn't eat any meat, and then I developed anemia. Uh, so you know different things i i had um chemical imbalance and it was pretty difficult on me so yeah the holy ghost revealed that it was because my mother is a whore and i apologize if this is supposed to be kid friendly I'm no just, it's not um, we say fuck a lot on the show okay, actually cool so they said i can't that believe she a... just called her mother a fucking whore no That's the holy the, ghost called her mama holy ghost. excuse me all right sorry 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 i digress Okay, it's the Holy Ghost told me that my mother was a whore, and that uh, and that because of her actions, I had a chemical imbalance. So it wasn't until I was fifteen years old, I was like pretty dark kid. Like I kept cutting myself. I was like super malnourished, and um, I ended up telling my mom, "Hey, I this is what the Holy Ghost said," and 
Latino rage. <laughs> she went crazy on the pastor and we left and we've never been back since. Um, but the main creepy part was the mom. whole Holy Ghost thing. Well, yeah. I'll be honest, for the last two years, the Holy Ghost has been trying to get booked on the show and we won't let him <laughs> on. So this this makes it for sure that we're not letting the Holy Ghost come on to talk wrestling with us. So you are you have cemented that. Thank you so much because we were like this close. We're, Lars even this week sent me an email like, "Hey, should we let this Holy Ghost guy come on?" We're like, ah, "No, maybe not." So thank That's you. Insane. Yeah, well, That's thank insane. you guys for opening the door. I actually have never been open about this. Never talked about this in any other well, podcast. Well, so there you have it. <laughs> well, thank you very much for doing that. I mean, I know that's like you know a very it's tough. Deep, thing and you know one of one of the things we try to do with this podcast is get more of the human interest story we're not a dirt sheet you know that's why we've been around for as long as we have and we get guests like yourself on there so you know like you were saying and i just want to touch one more uh, into this subject one more time you said that you kind of brought aspects so you brought rituals into the character um now do, do you get to a place with yourself thinking, okay, I experienced that, but I experienced that now for a reason. And now I can look at it in a little bit of a different light because I'm now using this into my performance or taking that aspect and bring, bringing it into my performance. Do you feel like you have um, um, a little bit more, um, how would I say, closure with, with your experience? Um, I got closure a long time ago. You know, I the minute that I left, I felt so free that I that to me that was the closure being able to actually have a life because I wasn't Mm -hmm. allowed to do so many things so the fact that my mom was on board with me just exploring and doing different things it was a really beautiful experience and she apologized for even having us there but it wasn't her fault her mom brought her up in that church as well so it's like a generational thing so I did find some peace there I don't think that it's made my wrestling performances any better i do think that um as far as my spiritual life goes it helped me a lot because i always wondered i knew that this was all bullshit i knew it Mm. i knew it i kept telling my mom i'm like this makes no sense this is stupid anyway um the fact that that happened i always grew up with the desire of wanting to know more about the nature of my reality and Mm. what is the truth so it ended up leading for me to go soul searching and finding the roots and that's how i ended up in the hebrew roots and the rest is history now i'm jewish (laughs) so uh and we've gone down this road but i'm very curious about the aspect of was there any apprehension for you going from a cult into the jewish religion were you a little bit like "Ah, i've already been down this road before were you free of this one experience and open-minded to go down this other one well, I went down different holes, if you want to call it that. I, For a little bit, I was a law of attraction type of person. I would just be spiritual, which nobody knows what that actually means. This Everybody has a different interpretation of what that is. But I was just like trying to find something that was aligned with me. I tried Buddhism. I was interested in studying Hinduism. So I've always been very open. I don't think that just because a person can be so evil and do things in the name of whoever like I don't think that because of that I am I shouldn't have a religion I just I just got more curious and I'm I've always been super open-minded to everything I even uh, as dark as this is I even opened the Satan uh, Bible and uh, not for me definitely not for me but I explored it so I'm, I'm just open I'm it scared me a little bit in the beginning because I did not want to fall into another cult. But mm. everything that I've discovered in the religion that I'm in makes me feel very comfortable, happy. I've been in a better place ever since. So now I, I do want to jump in and ask this. Can we go through different time periods of your wrestling career to see the different points where you were religiously? Because now I'm curious to see, like, was there could you go and like, you know, 2007 i was kind of buddhist and you can see that in this character and then 2010 i did a short stint in satanism and you can see that here and do you see where i'm going with this question (laughs) yeah well i was never uh satanic okay Uh, yeah i mean but you know what i mean 
never did that. Um, yeah, you know, I don't believe in symbols. That's not- just Ronnie James Dio's grandma. <laughs> It's whoever wants to do whatever they want. It's fine. I believe that everybody has an equal chance to connect with the higher entity that we nobody knows what it really is. Um, so everybody has their own path. It doesn't matter what religion you choose. Um, but we could say at the beginning of my career, I was pretty much agnostic. I acknowledged that there was a being, but I didn't really want to partake in anything. I just wanted to live. So. That's when I had my broken leg, um, but my career was taking off then, so I was fine. Then um, about two years into MLW, that's when I started down the path of Buddhism and studying what it was and understanding that it's not a religion, it's more of a lifestyle, and it's about being okay, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, no matter what moment in your life, you're just okay. Um, the Hinduism was not for me. I'm not going to praise multi-gods because I have no idea who I'm talking to. That scares me. So d- just studied that. Didn't want to didn't wanna actually partake. Islam, not for me. Um, I don't believe in multiple wives. I, I'm I do, by the way. I'm one woman. Hello. I can have multiple husbands, but multiple wives. No, thanks. Then my boyfriend's not down for multiple husbands, so that's not going to work for us. Uh, I'm out, then. I'm just a straight <laughs> pagan, you know what I mean? Like, whatever. <laughs> but um, I think that's you know what I, what I hear from you a lot is about finding yourself, you know, and because that's kind of what these journeys are in a lot of ways, you know, especially with the spiritual aspects. You know, I feel like one, you know, we try to find ourselves, and it can be in different ways, you know. Yeah. Uh, organized religion has never really been my thing, but. I see that like, you know, the performance side of my life was always where I really felt more at home. It never, it gave me something in a weird way uh, that I knew that I had, um, but it just sort of maybe it manifested because I was able to get in front of an audience to do this. Yeah. Did you feel like you had that same experience? Um. Yeah, I've always, even though I have my religion, I've always been a firm believer in manifestation and I mm-hmm. build projection boards. So I will put up like little images of where I want to be in my career. And I will say every single thing that I put on that board has happened. Especially including being on MLW. Yeah. So exactly. That was the main one. <laughs> I made it. <laughs> That's fucked up. She's smart ass. She's a smart ass. <laughs> okay um well go ahead sorry dennis your turn oh i don't know i was still basking my great joke there hang on two more seconds <laughs> yeah okay it. There we... it's it wasn't there. <laughs> uh, you know as as you grow older you know what you know and you're still uh i guess in the wrestling industry considered a young pup as you grow older do you have I don't know, highlights or or goals that you want to reach? Are you a day-by-day kind of person? We'll see what happens tomorrow when it comes to the wrestling industry because you hear so many stories about people whose career gets cut off so short or, I mean, opposite of you where guys were like, I was going for my master's and I learned how to do a suplex and I stopped. You stopped wrestling to get your education I, I, what does, what does Selena in the wrestling industry, how do you grow with it? So I used to be the type of person to be daydreaming 24 seven and like, where do I want to be? What's next? What's next? And super enthusiastic about it. But the, my five-year plan getting into wrestling ended up being a lot better. I mean, uh, ended up coming out to be a lot better than what I had pictured for myself. So with that experience, I realized, wow, maybe I shouldn't sell myself so short and have these little expectations when I can reach big heights. But instead of like trying to figure out where is it that I'm headed, I'm more of a let me take in whatever is happening. So I'm very like conscious and I'm always looking to see if there's an opportunity. If somebody messages me, and I'm not saying a fan, like I, I do my research, so but if somebody me. messages me with a legit opportunity and something that seems to be aligned with the things that I like to do, then I take that as a sign and I move forward with that. I not really, I don't care what, actually, I really don't care. Whatever happens in my life, I'm going to enjoy it because I don't, 
in my entire life, I've never experienced a moment that is so dark that it'll suck me into it and I can't get out of. So because of that, I feel like no matter what, I'm going to be okay. So um, mm-hmm. I, I take it in as it comes. Well, for my last question, you know, I was thinking about what you've been saying throughout this podcast. And I was thinking, is she like, what happens if you know, a bigger opportunity in wrestling comes across, comes along? I mean, do you put the, uh, the wrestling and elephant off to the side? Do you put the, you know, the, re- the wrestling circus, sorry. Um, do we put that off to the side and go and go here? Or, I mean, cause what you've been talking about is kind of like, you know, if the, if the opportunity presents myself, I just go that way. You just said it. Right. So I'm just kind of curious, are you going to put things on the back burner and travel forward in the, your wrestling career? Well, I think that uh, big opportunities are relative. Like um, people can say like uh, WWE is knocking on the door. That is the biggest opportunity. However, they're <laughs> like being realistic, the way that their contracts work the money it's usually not what i would consider big money so to me is i would have to sell everything that i have and give up on my job and give mlw up and maybe put my circus on the back burner so to me that is not an option that is aligned with where i want to be so to me i wouldn't see that as a big opportunity i would see that as an option that I don't want to take. So to me, mm. uh, an opportunity that is aligned with me would be an angel investor that says, hey, do you have anything that you want to pitch? And I'd be like, yes, I have a circus. And then I pull out my big, big module where I've been putting everything that relates to my circus. So mm. that is an opportunity that is aligned with me. If I see an opportunity that is a uh, Spanish wrestling company that wants to partner up with major league wrestling, then that's an opportunity for me because that's aligned. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of how I work. It's not just any opportunity that comes. It just has to go with what I want. Got it. My, my last question may be a pat on your back kind of question, but uh, you look through the history of Puerto Rican and, and Spanish wrestling and you are closing in on being on the top tier of where some of the greats have been you're one of the first executive producers of a tv show a lot of people don't know that and do you look at yourself and how i mean i don't know if this is like a self-serving question but how do you look at yourself as i want people to look at me and and go hey selena de la renta this is where i am and people can come up to me. So how do you view yourself or bring your bring yourself up to the point where you go, people should go and, and follow their dreams because this is step A, B, and C to where I am? Um, I'm not sure I quite get the question. I don't but, either. Okay, but trying it to make- good as in my head, and then I started <laughs> talking and I couldn't stop. Um, it's okay. Um, so what I think you're saying is it how do I see myself? Yes, because yeah, I as mean, a lot of people may not view you yet as a Puerto Rican hero and you're climb, climbing up that ladder to be one of that. And how do you bring people up to where you are of your culture? Well, I do. I really do hope that my story is an inspiration to other Puerto Rican women and guys as well. I living uh, having lived in puerto rico for 17 years i know that it's very easy for people to think that oh nobody becomes famous that's just celebrities but the rest of the people were just little and that is very much the collective mentality and it's very easy for puerto ricans to bash other people's dreams and i would know because Again, I grew up there, so it's very common. It's not just me criticizing my island. This is exactly what I lived. Like you tell somebody that you want to be on TV and they're like, hi, yeah, sure, whatever. So, But I never thought of it like it's not going to happen for me. I always stood by what I wanted. And I believe that no matter how, no matter what your situation is, you could be homeless or you could be super rich. If you want to manifest something, you can do it. It doesn't matter Yes, uh, money, it makes things easier, but I I believe that hard work pays off. Like if you really commit to it, you're going to make it. Nobody can say otherwise. 
Lars, anything else? I think it's the perfect way to end it. Selena, where can people find you? You can find me on social media at Selena De La Renta. I will be attending every MLW show for the next year. And uh, you can see me live at Philadelphia on October 14th. You can get your tickets at MLW2300.com. And you should. You should want to watch that. It's going to be epic. I'll be honest with you. Uh, Court said if we don't hit those three things, he will never book anybody else. So don't forget because I'm under contract with Court. I got to say Thursdays, YouTube, Fight TV Plus, Cable Saturday <laughs> Nationwide on BEN Sports, MLW2300.com. Yes. Tickets start at $15, Court. I got it in. That's there cheap. My friend. Very much so for wrestling shows. So if you're, what, Philadelphia, right. you got to go there. And don't forget MLW Slaughterhouse, Saturday, October 14th. That's what we've been promoting. Go there. Make sure you go see Selena. Tell her you've seen her here because let's be honest, guys, it's a wrestling perspective. And I'm everybody's sex symbol. I am probably the 15th greatest looking wrestling podcaster out of Michigan in the Howell area. So I am very proud wow. of myself. Don't be I think impressed. I'm going to be a lesbian now. <laughs> You know what? <laughs> <laughs> if that, uh, I'll be honest. Hey, Dennis, so that's the reaction wait. most girls give me when I say that. So uh, <laughs> you're not the first one. I just marked that down as number seventeen and saying <laughs> and lesbian with me. So even my daughter, I'm great at that. So uh, yeah. Well, wrapping up. Definitely the don't want to put your daughter on that list. That. Oh, no, she's already gay. She's very proud and out at 15. So I've ruined a lot of lives. So it's great. So you're just you're just a name on a long list. My <laughs> ex-wife, my other ex-wife, my daughter, 19 girls I've dated than you. So, you know, and there's probably five more after you in the next week. It's it's all right. Yeah, your math sucks, too. You already said it was 17. Now it's 19. You get the by program. the minute. Yeah, I do. I went to school in Georgia. Of course, my math sucks. So, Selena, uh, this has been a blast. I can't believe we talked about your. You, you let me, let, Selena, yes. you know, it's been a blast. Yeah. But... It's been a blast watching him bury him fucking self at the yeah, end. Yeah, that's been great. It's been so, Selena, th I'm just going to wrap it up because I got to take my kid back to his mom and then I got to catch a flight. But thank you so much for your time. It was really awesome to have you here we root for you and we wish you nothing but the best in the future and for myself Lars Fredrickson and Dennis Farrell this has been the wrestling pod perspective podcast we'll see You're you guys right. next time all right uh everybody at home we'll say goodbyes off the air goodbye have a good week we'll talk to you later yeah 